Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar marking the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and of the Prevention of this Crime, entitled What Happened to the Promise? The Situation of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020, organized by Lord Alton of Liverpool and the Coalition for Genocide Response. My name is Evelina Ohab and I'm the co-founder of the Coalition for Genocide Response. I'm joined, joined by my colleagues Jess Templeman and Anton De Piro, and a distinguished panel of experts that I will introduce shortly. The Armenian genocide took place between 1915 and 1923, when 1 1.5 million ethnic Armenians were arrested, deported, and murdered by the Ottoman Empire. Currently, some 32 countries recognize the events as meeting the legal definition of genocide. The official recognition of historic cases as genocide is not a matter of semantics. Such an official recognition is crucial for survivors and their families in their efforts to move on. It is crucial for reconciliation and discovery of the truth. It is crucial to deter similar crimes in the future and to ensure that such atrocities do not happen again. However, as in the case of Armenians in 2020, we see early warning signs that the practices that targeted the communities of 100 years ago in the Ottoman Empire are being reinforced yet again. During our webinar, the panelists will discuss the warning signs of mass atrocities and the needed responses to ensure that the Armenians are not let down yet again. Today, you will hear from Lord Alton of Liverpool, crossbench peer at the UK House of Lords and patron of the Coalition for Genocide Response, Baroness Caroline Cox, crossbench peer at the UK House of Lords and founder of our humanitarian organization HEART, Jeffrey Robertson QC, founder and joint head of Doughty Street Chambers, and Gulnara Shahinian, human rights expert and author. We should have some time for questions at the end. Please uh, use the Q&A function to send your questions. And now without further ado, I give the floor to Lord Alton of Liverpool. Thank you, Evelina. And thank you also for reminding us about today and what we're commemorating today. But the timing of this discussion couldn't be better because on Monday with all party support and after a terrific speech by my good friend Baroness Cox, whom we'll hear from later on, and by a thumping majority of 126, the House of Lords passed an amendment to the Trade Bill concerning trade, business as usual, with states involved in the crime above all crimes, genocide. In 1915, as we've just heard, a slow burn genocide still unrecognized by the United Kingdom took the lives of perhaps one and a half million Armenian Christians, a horror story captured by Franz Werfel's novel, 40 Days on Muzadag, among the books I might mention that was suppressed by the Nazis and burnt. The land of Armenia was dyed red with Armenian blood. Hundreds of thousands of other Armenians were the subject of mass deportations, and they formed the basis of today's worldwide diaspora. Others, perhaps as many as a million in the area bordering the Black Sea, were forced to convert to Islam. And to this very day, many families are said to hold on to their hidden Christian faith. Hans Morgenthau, senior, the United States ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, called it race murder. This historian, Arnold Toynbee, wrote of the premeditated and systematic nature of the genocide. His words, the attempt to exterminate the Armenians during World War I was carried out under the cloak of legality by cold-blooded government action. These are not mass murders committed spontaneously by mobs and private people, he said. Winston Churchill wrote that there is no reasonable doubt that this crime was planned and executed for political reasons. Hitler, of course, took the world's indifference and unwillingness to insist on justice as a signal that he could butcher Jews, disabled people, gypsies, homosexuals, Roma, and non-compliant religious minorities, famously, and I paraphrase, saying, who now remembers the Armenians? The Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, 49 of whose relatives were murdered in the Holocaust, was a student of those events. He coined the word genocide, developing the Genocide Convention of 1948, which requires us to prevent, to protect, and to punish, but so often, as I said in the debate on Monday in Parliament, honoured only in its breach. The folly of forgetting is graphically illustrated 
by Hitler's assertion that no one any longer remembered the Armenians. Hitler's ideology of a purified master race was inspired by the biological vision of a purified pan-Turkism based on racial origins and racial superiority. Even his corruption of medicine and science drew inspiration from the deliberate infecting of Armenians with typhus in a se sequence of medical experiments. In the end, it led to the deaths, of course, of six million Jews. If in 1915 the world had saved the Armenians, or after World War I held those responsible to account, would Hitler have believed that he could act against the Jews with impunity, and might a Holocaust have been averted? Genocide begins when we ignore the canary in the mine, and when we forget our duty to prevent and to uphold justice. Ignore it, and it emboldens perpetrators who believe we're too weak or too disinterested to ever hold them to account. In Armenia in 1915, the wider world war was used as a re reason not to act. During the Holocaust, claims that things couldn't be so bad triggered silence until it was very, very late. In Srebrenica, appeals for help were ignored even by commanders of European soldiers stationed nearby. I first learned about the Armenians when I was just a boy from my dying grandfather. As a soldier in the First World War, he was with Allenby at the Battle of Jerusalem. He brought back pictures of Armenians murdered by the retreating Ottomans. He entrusted them to me. I still have them. Ten years ago, accompanied my, by my daughter just before she went up to university and is now a barrister, we saw the same photographs at the Genocide Memorial in Yerevan. We travelled to Armenia with Caroline, Lady Cox, and also to Nagorno-Karabakh. And I know that Caroline will say more about her very recent eyewitness visit to both Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia. But separately, I've also travelled in Azerbaijan and those parts of Turkey from which the Armenians were ethnically cleansed. Just before lockdown, I travelled to northern Iraq and took evidence from victims of the genocide against Yazidis and Christians. Among the refugees I met at Badarash refugee camp, I met a, an Armenian family who had been given refuge in a Kurdish village when they fled the 1919 genocide. Over the years, they've been protected and assimilated into the Kurdish community, but they know that they're of Armenian origin. And here they were fleeing aerial bombardment with white phosphorus dropped by Turkey, a NATO country. That family told me that they were fleeing a continuing slow burn genocide. And in Nagorno Karabakh, the same war crimes, including the bombing of a maternity hospital, civilian populations, and executions by beheading, have been committed in Turkey's proxy war. This is not only an extension of the Ottoman genocide, it's also an extension of Stalin's atrocities. Throughout the 1920s, Stalin created boundaries that placed Armenian villages deep inside Azerbaijan and vice versa. And in particular, he placed Nagorno Karabakh mountainous black garden, as the name means, I think, whose population was largely Armenian and had initially been promised autonomy inside Azerbaijan. Throughout the 1930s and 40s, Stalin tried to systematically destroy Armenian culture and national identity. During the 1930s, at least 100,000 Armenians were victims of his purges, and all the churches except Ejmiastin, the seat of the Catholicos, the senior ecclesiastical leader of the Apostolic Armenian Church, were closed. In 1938, even that town was suppressed and the Catholicos Koran I was murdered. Every church in Karabakh was shut and 10 years ago, the primate of Shushi, the fortress city of Karabakh, uh, told me how one wave of horror had been followed by another. One of his episcopal predecessors had been decapitated at the time of the genocide by Turkish genocidaires. His great uncle, a priest, was murdered while the churches and monasteries were closed by Stalin. And as recently as the 1990s, his words, Armenian soldiers were literally crucified during the war with Azerbaijan. And as we'll hear, it isn't over yet. A fatal chain of events stretches from the Armenian genocide to Hitler's concentration camps and the depredations of Stalin's gulags and even Mao's cultural revolution from the pestilential nature of persecution, demonization, scapegoating and hateful prejudice to the recent genocides against Christians and other minorities in Iraq and Syria. In 1914, remember, Christians made up a quarter of the Middle East's population. Now they're less than 
Syria's Christian population has declined from 1.7 million in 2011 to below 450,000 in Iraq. Ethnic cleansing and genocide has reduced the ancient Christian population from 1.5 million to below 120,000. Let me end where my political life began. There's a little patch in Liverpool called Low Hill. It's the council ward, the neighbourhood, where as a 21-year-old, as a student, I was elected to Liverpool City Council. Low Hill was the 19th century home of something called Hengler's Circus. And it was in that great auditorium that on September the 24th, 1896, at the age of 86, the Liverpool-born Victorian Prime Minister, William Ewart Gladstone, gave his very last public speech. Two years later, he died of cancer. But that day, 6,000 people gathered to hear him. The Times reported that many more thronged outside. He said he'd come to rouse the conscience of the nation. That speech was a defense of the beleaguered Armenian people. And it was a speech that I took with me during my travels with Lady Cox to Armenia and the God of Karabakh. The Henkler Circus speech came after a minor uprising in 1894 in Sasun in Turkish Armenia. The Armenians and other Christians were forced to pay double taxes and were denied many civil rights. Their protests <laughs> against this discrimination led to their wholesale slaughter. And throughout 1895, a series of pogroms were carried out throughout Turkey's Armenian provinces and even in the capital, Istanbul. And they would set the scene for the Armenian genocide of 1915. Gladstone took first-hand accounts of the killings from Armenians who traveled to Harden Castle, his home in North Wales. He said, the powers of language hardly suffice to describe what has been and is being done. And exaggeration, if we were ever so much disposed to it, is in such a case really beyond our power. Gladstone reflected that only the enormity of the sickening horrors perpetrated against the Armenians and a strong sense of duty could have induced a man of my age to abandon what he called the repose and quietude of his retirement to embark on what would be his last great mission. He declared, these are his words, we are not dealing with a common and ordinary question of abuses of government. We are dealing with something that goes far deeper, four awful words, plunder, murder, rape, and torture. He said that this is no crusade against Mohammedanism, but whatever faith had been held by the Armenians, his words, it would have been incumbent upon us with the same force and the same sacredness to speak out on their behalf. With precision, Gladstone identifies and names the Ottoman Turkish Sultan, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the assassin, he called him, as responsible for the order to massacre the Armenians. And he roundly condemned the European powers for giving the Sultan, his words, the assurance of impunity. While believing that ideally Europe should act together, he bitterly criticized their failure to do so and said this. Collectively, the powers have undergone miserable disgrace. He said that when the world fa failed to act, Britain had the right to act alone and not, his words, make herself a slave to be dragged at the chariot wheel of other powers. Many of these same arguments have relevance and application in our <laughs> own times but so does the challenge which comes at the culmination of his Hengler Circus address. He demands no ambiguity, no neutrality, no countenancing, but renunciation and condemnation of crimes against humanity, which, again his words, have already come to such a magnitude and such a depth of atrocity that they constitute the most terrible, most monstrous series of pre proceedings that have ever been recorded in the dismal and deplorable history of human crime. Within a decade, the Armenian genocide would take place. The horrors that occurred then are horrors taking place in our own times. And Gladstone's challenge in Hengler Circus remains a challenge today. Thank you very much, Lord Alton, for your, uh, for your um, contribution. And now I would like to give the floor to Baroness Caroline Cox, crossbench peer at the UK House of Lords and founder of HEART. Baron uh, Baroness Cox, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I cannot see you all because I'm having to come by phone because my Zoom is not working. But I'd like to show uh, some pictures because if you have the first slide, please. I just returned from the anguish and faith in Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia where the people in Nagorno-Karabakh are suffering a genocide today 
in the terms that Lord Alton has described in such graphic and historic uh, effectiveness in the opening lecture, for which I would thank him very much. I'm first going to invite you just to witness a few of the scenes of the suffering of the people in Nagorno-Karabakh, and then highlight the urgent priorities which we brought back with us from our visit. Next slide, please. Uh, we're now in the 1,000-year-old monastery of Daddy Vank, and the bishop there, uh, Father Johannes, is desperate. We saw him conduct the last wedding. He'll be conducting there, at least for the foreseeable future, because it was about to go into Azerbaijan-held territory. And he's caressing one of the 800-year-old hatchkars or holy crosses, fearing that when Azerbaijan takes control of the monastery, they may, as they so often do, and they did in the Kitchevan, destroy all the holy places. So he was a man who was absolutely grief-stricken. Grief also, he'd been very lonely. He said during all the suffering, the fighting the previous 45 days, no one from international Christianity had been in touch with him to offer him a word of consolation or comfort or solidarity. So Daddy Vank uh, now is in part of the country occupied by Azerbaijan, and Father Johannes, I think, is in Yerevan. Next slide, please. Armenians are a people of great faith. They love praying with candles. I took this picture actually in the previous war in the early 1990s in the wonderful monastery at Gandazar, and that was a place saved by miracles. It's a wonderful, wonderful monastery, and Azerbaijan was destroying all the holy places, as it always does, and Gandazar sits on a mountain promontory. It's a sitting duck, a target for air bombardment. Again and again, the Azeri fighter bombers flew over and dropped their bombs directly on that cathedral. Again and again, a divine arm swept them aside, and the monastic outbuildings just 12 yards away are absolutely flattened. But the only bomb which got through that divine, bar, divine protection uh, never exploded. It imploded in a war, one of the monastic outbuildings, and that monastery still stands today to the glory of God. Next slide, please. This is just one of the very, very, very ancient stone um, sort of uh, relics uh, that you find in uh, Dadivank, and that is extremely old. That will be taken to Armenia for safekeeping. Next slide, please. Uh, Lord Orton referred to the bombing of the maternity hospital. We visited the maternity hospital, which had received a direct hit. That is what remains of it. There were actually um, operations and deliveries of babies going on in the basement while that hospital got a hit. But of course, it is a crime against humanity deliberately to target places, civilian sites and places of such important importance for health and so on, such as the maternity hospital. That is what remains of the maternity hospital in Stepanakert. Next slide, please. And this is what remains of the Art and Music College in Stepanakert, again, devastated by bombardment. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of the direct bombing of civilian homes. You see the burnt out car, you see the burnt out bombing uh, building. It is, again, against legal conventions uh, to deliberately to attack the civilians. And that is part of a civilian uh, part of Stepanakert. Next slide, please. Here, this in the background is the remains of the electricity station, which is crucial, obviously, for providing light and heat. And that was deliberately targeted. And it meant that the people hiding in the basements and cellars while the bombardment was going on had neither light nor heat. Just in front, uh, to my right, is Vardan Fedivosian. He is the director of the Inspirational Rehabilitation Center that was built after the last war, which finished in 1994. And he turned a bombed out old school building into what is now internationally recognized as a center of excellence, treating a thousand people a year and many more with outpatients and everyone with disabilities from little children, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, autism, has special autism unit, through to middle aged people with road traffic accidents or now probably, I'm afraid, military injuries, up to elderly people with strokes. He is an inspirational person. And someone visited, an expert in rehabilitation, visited that center last year and said it was 40, 40 years ahead of any center that he'd seen anywhere in the world. Vardan's patients and staff all had to flee during the bombing. They're beginning to go back. And we hope that perhaps it will be possible 
to reinstate the care for people with disabilities in Nagorno-Karabakh. And of course, it was so stigmatized in the former Soviet Union, there was no care for people with disabilities. So Vardan has developed a groundbreaking and inspirational center that is internationally recognized as a center of excellence, a real hero of the peace. And on the other side, my colleague, Reverend David Thomas, who was a chaplain in the Royal Marines for 20 years, now serves at our project logistics officer. But the real point of that pinned picture is the destroyed fire station, electricity station, in the background, because that, again, caused a lot of human suffering. On our way out from Stepanakert back to Yerevan, uh, a journey which would only take five hours, took 15 hours, because the way was completely um, solid and stationary, with people driving out with everything they could take, they have cattle, their sheep, their possessions, because their homes were going to be uh, occupied by Azerbaijan in the next 48 hours, and many of them burnt their homes before they left, and you could see them weeping in front of their burning homes, uh, but they didn't want to leave their homes for others to occupy and possibly desecrate. Back in Armenia, we met some of the refugees who got to Armenia, and here is a young lad, age 12, and this building belongs to the church, and they were offering um, accommodation and warmth and food uh, to about 100 refugees there. We, I was talking to a lady, and she's lost her husband, and she's terrified of opening her phone. Because one of the things that Azerbaijan had been doing was to take prisoners of war, torture them, behead them or kill them in some horrible way, and take the photos on their own phones, because they took the phones off the soldiers, and then send those images back to their families. And the lady I spoke to was crying her eyes out understandably, and she said, I dare not look at my phone. I don't know what I'm going to see. But in the middle of that grief, this young boy, aged about 12, just sat down at the piano and played absolutely beautifully. And next slide, please. I just pay tribute to a people who, even through genocide, earthquake, and war, can preserve and promote their traditional heritage, their historic culture, and provide inspirational education to the younger generation. That 12 year old playing the most beautiful piano music was very, very inspirational and moving. I move quickly now on to some of the urgent priorities raised in our report, which reflect the priorities that were raised with us. Next slide, please. First, the maltreatment of prisoners. Despite a ceasefire, reports of brutality against military and civilian prisoners continue to emerge, including torture, and we saw the most horrible, horrible film of torture, which I won't tell you with, or they give you the same nightmares that they give to me and beheadings, and we were told that the Syrian jihadists, 4,000 of them, that had been recruited by Turkey and taken into Azerbaijan, uh, carried out beheadings, and they were given, I think they said $200 for every Armenian they managed to behead. And there are claims that the Red Cross is unable to visit the many detainees. So there is a real worry, and worries me every day, what's going on with the maltreatment of Armenian prisoners. Next slide, please. Genocidal policies. According to a genocide emergency alert issued in October 2020 by Genocide Watch, Azerbaijan has reached stage 9 extermination and stage 10 denial of the 10 stages of the genocidal process. So according to Genocide Watch, Azerbaijan is guilty of genocide. Next slide, please. A war of terror. The adoption of tactics of terror affects a deep hatred of Armenians stretching back over 100 years the Armenian genocide, which has already been described so eloquently, and is reinforced now by an unprecedented rise in state-backed anti-Armenian rhetoric and the most vile things which they say about Armenians, which are on the record. And as we draw towards the close, another real concern is international impunity. Neither Azerbaijan nor Turkey has been held to account in any way for its actions, despite widespread evidence of atrocities and war crimes. I've mentioned the torture and the uh, slaughter of Armenians, but also um, there have been the use of illegal weapons, cluster bombs and smirch, and nobody, as far as I can see, is taking any action to hold Azerbaijan or Turkey to account, and it will continue with impunity unless some action is taken. Humanitarian aid, next slide, please. There are an estimated 100,000 refugees urgently needing help with accommodation, food, and medical care, those who couldn't leave Nagorno-Karabakh and those who didn't go to Armenia, but where they don't have any accommodation 
So humanitarian aid is a real priority. And next slide, please. Self-determination, absolutely critical for the future for the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. They, as you see, they're subject now to attempted genocide. The Armenians of Karabakh have sufficient evidence to claim the same right to independence as the people of Timor-Leste, Eritrea, and Kosovo. They were all subjected to the same horrendous attacks and attempted genocide by their neighbors, and they were given self-determination and autonomy and independence from those brutal neighbors. They were awarded self-determination for suffering comparable attempted ethnic cleansing, and the Armenians of Karabakh have every right to the same recognition of the right for self-determination. And I hope that is taken forward uh, because it will be the salvation for the future of the people of Karabakh. Without it, there's a real question whether the Armenians of Nagorno Karabakh will survive in Karabakh. And my final slide, last slide, is coming back from a visit like that, one feels absolutely, well, you feel, should I say, sort of shredded by the grief and the anger, the pain and the passion. And we have a little motto in heart, my small NGO. It's just, I cannot do everything, but I must not do nothing. And one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to share this pain and passion this afternoon is I hope we will find ways of doing something which we must do for truth and justice. Thank you very much for letting me share that pain and passion. Thank you very much, Baroness Cox. And now I would like to give the floor to Jeffrey Robertson QC, founder and joint head of Doughty Street Chambers. Good afternoon. Uh, it's very uh, great honor to be talking to you today about a passion of mine. It's not as deeply entrenched as Caroline's who's been working for so many years on the safety of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, I happened to visit there some years ago in order to do a report on its claim to independence. I interviewed all its judges, its lawyers, its uh, prime minister and various politicians. And I concluded that Nagorno-Karabakh, otherwise known as Artsakh, had a good claim in international law to independence. Firstly, it had been Armenian forever, since the earliest Christian churches you can find in the woods, uh, hundreds of them, if not thousands, going back to 340 AD, the first country to proclaim Christianity, as it happens. And there have been, there's proof of this, when it was taken over by the Russians in the early 19th century, they held a census and they established quite clearly that the great majority of the people in this mountainous area were the country in the clouds, as I call it, were in fact Armenians. And uh, the tragedy happened thanks to Stalin, influenced by Ataturk in 1923, when in dividing up the, uh, this area, he allocated the Nagora Karabakh region as an autonomous oblast, whatever that means, to Azerbaijan. Uh, that was a serious mistake. Uh, it didn't reflect reality. It was influenced, according to some historians, by Ataturk, who had the residual hatred of Armenians and didn't want them on his border. But uh, be that as it may, it was meant to be autonomous, but of course within the bounds of Azerbaijan. Well, that has lingered in international law quite ridiculously, and gives Azerbaijan its paper claim. Uh, it also relies on some ill-thought-out motions of the Security Council in 1994, which repeated the, the mistake. But, of course, they were hurriedly put together by people who didn't 
understand the background in order to try to get a truce uh, from the war which Armenia was winning. And so it made that uh, uh, deference to the Azerbaijan, to the Azeris in order to try to uh, get them to uh, uh, into a truce. But the reality is that um, that Nagora Karabakh has always been Armenian and remained Armenian, even in the 70s and 80s when Azerbaijan tried to change the demographics of the population by uh, transmigration, by moving Azeris into the area, but the, it still remains 75% Armenian. And then in 89, 90, uh, in the lead up to the war, after the pogroms of Armenia in Sumgait and Baku, awful killings, genocidal almost killings of Armenians, uh, which led to the war. And yes, Armenians did from time to time commit war crimes, every side does in war, but nothing compared to the siege of Stepanakert, which was one of the great war crimes uh, since the Great War. At, uh, target, it was Guernica. Guernica writ large, actually. There were far more casualties in Stepanakert thanks to the Aziris brutally and uh, criminally raining down from Sushi, which they occupied, uh, bombs on schools, on hospitals, over 2,000 people, innocent people, were killed in that wicked uh, war cry. Well, in 1994, Armenia, in effect, won the war and took back Nagora Karabakh. Uh, they had the people who won it with their own army, helped, of course, by people from the diaspora, but they had uh, succeeded. Now, they took a number of votes in this period and they voted eventually for independence because they were rightly proud of the, uh, their own army and their own defense against uh, terrible crimes. But uh, at one point they voted for unification with Armenia. And it's a bit of a tragedy historically that uh, they didn't pursue that objective because Although for 25 years, since 1994, they constructed a self-governing democratic republic with the assistance of Armenia, but not the control of Armenia. They operated their own law. And uh, they nonetheless remained uh, as an unrecognized, even by Armenia, republic. They would have been much better to have become part of Armenia. And then Armenia made a great mistake and it's responsible and we have to own up to it. It signed the treaty, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, but it didn't ratify it, didn't ratify it. And that is why there can be no, at the moment, immediate investigations of all the war crimes the Aziris are committing. That is Armenia's mistake in not ratifying the treaty. Of course, Azerbaijan didn't ratify it. So it falls to the Security Council of the United Nations and the Security Council is polaxed. And uh, therein lies Armenia's other mistake of giving itself over to Russia and uh, Russia, of course, is hopelessly conflicted. It sells arms to Azerbaijan, million, billions of pounds worth to attack Nagora Karabakh, and it sells Armenia at slightly less discount. And uh, so the oligarchs that are close to Haida are close to Putin. And so it's totally untrustworthy. Of course, it's got a treaty, it's got a base in Armenia, and it's got a 
as protection, self-protection treaty. Oh, says Putin, while Armenians and Nagorno-Karabakhians were being killed, doesn't apply, he said, to Nagorno-Karabakh. Well, the Security Council won't act because Russia has a veto, and uh, this now Russia has 2,000 troops uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, but is allowing uh, the Azeris to keep sushi, which they've taken, and Lakin and uh, other areas. So it's unfortunately for Armenia, because of its own uh, alliance with Russia, which is a faithless friend, and because it didn't ratify the ICC treaty, uh, it's in uh, this difficult position. But in my view, Nagora Karabakh, as with the countries that Caroline has mentioned, has a right of independence and of remedial succession. And that right uh, has never been acknowledged and never been pushed. Uh, I happen to know because I've in the past advised the uh, gov government of Armenia that it should sign the ICC treaty. It should push for this right. And uh, it's been intimated to me that Russia didn't want to do so. Well, I can't prove that, but uh, there it is. Uh, another faithless, uh, another example of a faithless delight. But we are where we are. And uh, unraveling the last few months is going to be difficult. We must never allow it to be forgotten that what has happened is the crime of aggression. The crime of aggression was added to the International Court Treaty in 2017. Uh, and it's plainly made up against Erdogan who, picking up the genocidal uh, tendencies that come from his denial of the 1915 genocide, arranged, it's clear, despite the lies of, of Turkey denying it, arranged for Syrian fighters to help the Azeris, and clearly had an arrangement with Haida to uh, support at a time when Armenia was weakened by the COVID crisis, uh, support the attack. It was clearly the crime of aggression. And in due course, this will go on for many years, uh, in due course, that must be brought home to these two men and their commanders. Uh, then, of course, uh, the crime of aggression also depends on the Security Council and the malign influence of Russia must be considered. It's no friend of Armenia. It would have been far better to look to the European Union and to uh, NATO for support, but it's too late for that now. The issues, the prisoners, the war crimes committed by the Azeris, unfortunately, because Amina hasn't ratified the ICC treaty, can't be prosecuted other than by a Security Council reference. And if Britain or France were to suggest one, I'd bet Russia would veto it. But there it is. Um, that's the way forward, and, and the demand must be, and Armenia must sign tomorrow the ICC treaty, so that uh, at least it's got an argument that uh, it can, uh, that the investigation into Azeri war crimes can be uh, continued. Genocide, well, yes, uh, genocide denial, persists in Turkey, and if you look at some of the speeches of Haida, oddly enough, the British Azeri ambassador in a letter to the Economist boasted of the way Haida had whipped up the crowds to attack uh, 
Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh uh, in a way that is was certainly uh, indicative of a desire for genocide. So there has to be a clear investigation of the incitement to genocide that was uh, uttered in Baku. And I would think that that is something that should be the, the, the duties of all the signatories to the genocide, the Convention Against Genocide. So, of course, there are, there's work to be done in terms of war crimes, in terms of uh, a case for aggression, in terms of the Treaty Against Genocide. And there's also work to be done, which should have been done years ago, in promoting the case for self-determination and the right of remedial secession, which uh, is that the Republic of Nagorno Karabakh is entitled. Now one can understand entirely the grief and anger that she encountered. And it may be that Armenia had no alternative to save lives at the end of the day to give in. But the Minsk process has gone on for 25 years to no avail largely because Azerbaijan refused to allow Nagorno Karabakh to be part of it. But uh, that is uh, a, possible, a possibility. Whatever happens, there is work to be done. And it may have to come from foundations uh, financed by the diaspora. I don't know. But uh, there is a great deal of evidence that must now be collected and submitted uh, on the basis of the crimes against humanity that were committed in this latest war. And, you know, they, these people who have uh, genocidal tendencies are never satisfied, and they will be back if Armenia finds itself in difficulties again, uh, then the beast of nationalism and racism will be unleashed again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, uh, for, for your presentation. And before I give the floor to our next speaker, I just wanted to remind everyone that about the respectful use of the chat function. And if there are any longer questions that you would like to ask, please feel free to email me and I will get back to you. Please make sure that you, apart from sending your question, you send also your um, name um, so that I'll be able to, and, and email address, of course, to, so that I'll be able to uh, respond to you. But again, um, let's, let's make sure that we engage in a respectful debate. And now without, uh, I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, Gulnara Shahinyan. Gulnara, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for invitation and having this important discussion on, on these days. And I'm very honored to be on a panel with long-term supporters of Armenia and Artsakh. Hardly you can find a person in Armenia or in Artsakh who doesn't know about tremendous work of uh, Caroline Cox uh, supporting Artsakh both humanitarianly and politically. The last months were the most unprecedented times for the recent history of Armenia, characterized by remarkable unity of all Armenians all over the world and multiple actions to support and stand by their brothers and sisters and hopes of receiving lasting peace and security. Then the war, unprecedented by its aggression and devastation, it came, taking uh, lives of so many people. Ceasefire agreement, which brought up with the new realities and culture of conducting agreements that is based not on interest of people, but power of land grabbing. And the current political crisis related to this decision and which is exacerbated additionally by measures to pressure the democratic government to resign. There are many emotions in Armenia, but the time is required and urgency is needed to have stability and time to develop plan of action 
in order to protect people in Artsakh and return those who are imprisoned in Azerbaijan and build the housing. I will speak on some dimensions today, and specifically on political dimension, human rights dimension, dimension of internal stability, and will conclude with some recommendations. Velvet Revolution that took place in Armenia less than three years ago renewed 30 years old hopes of Armenia to build its democratic state based on principles of democratic governance, equality of all before the law and fight against corruption. The victory of revolution gave people belief in their ability to affect change. For people in NCA, the revolution was also seen as hope and opportunity to get so much weighted recognition and protection that the recognitions assume. Maybe diplomatically acceptable and agreed the term of uh, an unrecognized state, but it's re re uh, legally ambiguous. The definition provides puts NCA in a situation of deadlock situation where citizens of unrecognized country have been either invisible, voiceless, or treated as people with low rights, which have been clearly demonstrated during this year and also during the war. Even UN, which is based on universal declaration of human rights, where equality for all is declared, was not very much proactive to recognize the need for protection of the displaced people from Nagorno-Karabakh, neither UNICEF, Armenia engaged itself in building a democratic country, but how to build new country in a such complex, receiving such a complex inheritance of connections, obligations, subordinations, and previous agreements? How to make the diplomacy, uh, the democracy being welcomed by the surrendered authoritarian states and members of political blocs that Armenia is party to? Uh, how, how to make it attractive by those who keep power on threat and building hatred toward others by corruption and members of war and ideas of expanding the influence and building religious and political blocs based on territorial gains, but no people's interests. This could not be welcomed, specifically in the light of democratic movements in Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and the different countries. The aggression consolidated so many autocratic regime against small and recognized states that is building its democracy and securing peace and future for its citizens. Another important aspect, the continuous signals of security and security and early and, uh, signals from the borders of Armenian Artsakh and militant rhetoric, rhetoric and strong authoritarian grip of Azerbaijan, for whom Artsakh has never been seen as territory inhabited by indigenous people with rights, but lent, tried to return, means of strengthening their grip even stronger uh, over, over the country, and of course, the continuous Turkish denial and refusal of genocide. It's active support to Azerbaijan in this war. Coupled with Turkish uh, President Erdogan's imperialist neo-Ottoman ideology and his criticism of 1923 Treaty of Lausanne that established the borders of modern Turkey, all of that fueled fears for Armenians. International community was busy with its own internal problems, practical interests and priorities, and continued to make declarative statement, asking both sides to stop the war. While there was enough time to learn that stopping defending themselves from aggression for, uh, for people in Nagorno-Karabakh might be annihilation. There is also standard statements made in the midst of the war that conflict uh, can be solved only peacefully while at the same time supplying Azerbaijan with weapons of destruction. And the watchful eyes of NATO and other international institutions, the crimes against humanity have been taking place, inflating the values and building distrust toward this organization. NATO never issued a warning towards this member state that was involved in recruiting and trafficking terrorists from Syria to Caucasus and creating new instability and criminal hub in the region. Three declared ceasefires lasted short with each other Azerbaijan army was bringing more uh, uh, people to the field and more destructing weapons, recruiting more mercenaries and targeting civil populations and civil objects, thus demonstrating its final intention, direct intentional ethnic cleansing and cultural cleansing and genocide.
This war was the most destructive that have been held in the history. And uh, all the crimes which are listed in the international humanitarian law have been committed against people in Nagorno-Karabakh during this aggression. These crimes have been well documented by local international experts, and both ombudsmen have been daily documenting all the, all the uh, violation of on the law. And I will start with some. Attacks against civilian population, individual citizens, and civil objects, both in Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia, indiscriminate attacks. In this period, more than 160 civil areas have been attacked using heavy, heavy missile artillery, causing considerable civilian deaths, leaving many people wounded, uprooting more than 100,000 civilians and destruction of their housing, property, and infrastructures. Two regions of Armenia have been also under attack, resulting in injuries and deaths. Recruitment and, in many cases, trafficking in mercenaries from Syrian terrorist groups to fight against population, thus spreading terrorism in the region. This fact has been also widely proved, and there are many evidence of this. Use of banned munitions and white phosphorus. Today, uh, I, I'm, I'm working now on compiling a book, and I was seeing the result of the use of white phosphorus. They are horrendous. Many international human rights organizations that working in Nagorno-Karabakh, like Human Rights Watch, confirmed the repeated use of cluster munitions. Israeli made MO95 DPSM Azerbaij uh, by used Azerbaijan again the populated areas and cities of Nagorno-Karabakh and showed fragment disregard for safety of citizens. Azerbaijani armed forces employed weapons containing white phosphorus, destroying not only environment, humans and bringing suffering to all combatants. Attacks against journalists. There are many evidence of injuries of dozens of foreign and local journalists as a result of art artillery attack on the Azerbaijani forces directed against cities of Martuni, Mardakert, Hardrut, as well as at attacking Ghazanchetot Cathedral of Shushi, allegedly using military aircraft and you have seriously wounded three journalists. There are evidences of direct attack on journalists which did not take place in hostilities. Attacks against cultural objects. On October 8, Azerbaijani armed forces carry out two attacks against uh, uh, St. Hazan Cathedral in Shushi using military aircraft and UAF, Turkish Bayraktar, uh, uh, as alleged uh, by all military experts. The first attack by the military aircraft already targeted and damaged the cathedral. Attacks against humanitarian assistance and rescue service, hospitals, personnel, military hospitals, maternity hospitals have been bombarded and destroyed, as well as vehicle transported wounded people, as well as offices of humanitarian organizations and their transport that are in the situation that are situated in a close, close by buildings. Crime against horde combat and, and civilians. According to interrogation of civilians, and this was mentioned many times, uh, uh, of Syrian mercenary who had been captured and later being prosecuted under the criminal code of Armenia, both his immediate commander and Turkish Azerbaijani commander gave orders to behead, kill, and slaughter all Armenians. 100,000 was promised for each beheading. A number of videos and photos have been posted and circulated in social media demonstrating the crimes against Armenians, such as killing, beheading, ill treatment, and uh, uh, of horde the combatant civilians, mutilation of dead bodies, inhuman, humiliating treatment of Armenian prisoners of war and captured prisons, uh, uh, captured by Azerbaijani armed forces, humiliating uh, treatment of dead prisoners. Uh, there is also, when I was speaking about all these dimensions and internal dimensions, we uh, entire, I mean, uh, according to agreement uh, that has been signed, peace agreement, the bodies and the, uh, the uh, powers have to be returned immediately to uh, and, and exchanged with Azerbaijani powers. While Armenia is taking uh, uh, into consideration its obligation, Azerbaijan delays, using also it as a a measure against a uh, government of Armenia, creating a democratically elected government of Armenia, creating tensions and the, the, the stress of the people who are in the country, uh, you know, re, uh, re, re asking government to act in this, uh, on this behavior. 
this is a, a, a really a horrendous war with a horrendous violation of human rights that we're speaking all about. And uh, yeah, I will, I, I will uh, uh, speak on the steps, practical steps, which I think needs to be taken immediately. And uh, they, they are quite urgent and action and engagement in a long-term process uh, and sustained efforts. First of all, support to democratic processes in Armenia. As I said, there is a very hard situation in Armenia with and a big pressure on the government. We need to, uh, you know, all, uh, we, we need the democratically elected government and Armenia needs to continue with the democratic reforms. Return of the old corrupted government is completely unacceptable. And it, uh, so support to democratic processes in Armenia and support to, um, uh, uh, consolidations of constitutional consolidation of constitutional reform is first needed. Return to format of means group, uh, which which is uh, critically important, and that was mentioned very much by uh, um, you know means group member states. It is very important to mention the timing on the war when you uh, OSC doesn't have the uh, secretary general and means group could not act. As as react uh, as uh, uh, I was asked, so format uh, and there are so many now uh, uh, statements from new secretary general of OEC, a French uh, 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 Miss Group uh, co-chair and American co-chair on returning to format of Miss Group and discussing this with the Miss Group format. There is uh, there are a lot of concerns related to what has been done with Russian agreement. First of all. The agreement, as I said, brings a new culture of land grabbing, not considering people's lands, not considering people's rights. There is nothing said about what, what people are going to do, how the people will be protected. But it says about who took the amount of land, he would keep this amount of land. land. This is, the land is seen as a trophy. Uh, uh, bringing also uh, troops, uh, peacekeeping troops, Russian peacekeeping troops, uh, in uh, a Minsk um, agreements, in a agreement, the, uh, the countries these, that are involved in negotiations of the conflict should not use their own, um, uh, you know, army uh, to guard uh, the, the the peace process in the country, and uh, 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 you know, request from Turkey to be there. Have ever somebody seen the country which was an aggressor to be monitoring the peace process? Or even if the Russian troops are standing there, how can and they want to monitor their own uh, uh, work? How the people who are whose rights have been violated by peacekeeping troops, troops, and this happened in many parts of the world, whom they are going to apply for protection? How this is going to work? So it is important to return to Ms. Group format and restart negotiations. And also maybe for a better, for a long-term solution and a new, uh, uh, so to say, new discussions involved women in this peace process. It proved very, very effective for many years, uh, for many countries, and it invested in stability and long-term peace. Then, develop all the measures of recognition of Artsakh, as it was said, as a primary condition of the security of people in Artsakh. And there are many avenues, many legal avenues, and many UN conventions and documents. Of course, these are, some of them are in a soft law, but they can be used to, this, to, the, the, to develop uh, you know, policies and recommendations in order to recognize Artsakh. There are many already processes established all over the world, French Senate recognition, Belgian Senate recognition, many cities have recognized this process is going on, and this is critically important. A special, of course, it was mentioned by uh, uh, Mr. Robertson about Armenia ratifying uh, the, um, um, I ICC convention. It is critically important. But I think also it will be very important to establish special court on crimes against humanity committed by Azerbaijan and Turkey against people of Nagorno-Karabakh. Not only you should clearly state their uh, positions on Turkey and international community should also declare their uh, statement on this situation. Not recognizing this 
uh, atrocities, not recognizing crimes, it has a tradition of returning back, as we all see. This, the, the, uh, nothing has been changed the, in, in the way and the measures have taken. Just, just weapons are becoming more destructive that from uh, 105 years ago. Weapons are becoming more destructive and more people are killed. So, but people's intention are not changed. So if it has not been recognized, if it not been uh, recognized as crime against humanity, this process will continue. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Gulnara. We still have 12 minutes for Q&A, and so I'll give the floor now to Jessica Templeman to continue with the Q&A session. Thank you, Evelina, and um, thank you to all of our panelists for your extremely interesting and, um, well, very wide ranging, dealing with many different aspects of what is a very complicated um, and, well, just very complex and long-standing situation. Um, I just wondered, firstly, picking up on many of the questions and the conversation that's been going on, um, there, this is obviously a long running debate and there are accusations of crimes on both sides. Um, and there is, there is obviously a large pointing to, to flaws within the international systems um, around UN veto and ratification of treaties. I just wondered, considering this, um, what steps can the international community or specific states maybe take to consider potential crimes on all sides and hopefully work to address the potential dehumanization that's occurring um, across all sides of the debate? So this is for all the panelists. I've just had a good idea. Can I offer it to you? Of course. As I've said, all this talk about war crimes courts and so forth is very good, but Armenia has been its own worst enemy because it hasn't ratified the ICC treaty. And it's been its own worst enemy by putting itself in the malevolent arms of Russia. If there were to be a suggestion from Britain or France that a war crimes court be set up, Russia would veto it. And on the Security Council, Russian vetoes apply. But let me tell you that there is a new area for human rights uh, abuse that's opened up. I have before me on the 7th of December of this year, that was two days ago, the European Union announced a Magnitsky law they didn't call it that for fear of upsetting Russia, but it's a new plan in which America, Canada, Britain, as of a few months ago, Mr. Rabb introduced one, and Australia has announced they're going to introduce a law that provides targeted sanctions on human rights abusers. So, what happens is if you identify serious human rights abusers and those involved in serious corruption, then you Magnitsky these people or target them. Magnitsky was, uh, he was a lawyer actually, who was beaten to death in a Russian prison. And his, uh, one of his clients, Bill Browder, persuaded John McCain and President Obama to pass a Magnitsky law back in 1212, and it's now being picked up around the world as a means of dealing with human rights abusers. Their credit cards are cancelled. Poor old Carrie Lamb has been <laughs> sanctioned and she can't, she has to wheel all her money home and put it under the bed. So it causes inconvenience, it causes great loss of money to those involved in human rights abuse and uh, so on. So I think the task now that Europe has this is to identify, particularly the financiers of the killers, the Turkish drones, it was Turkish drones that did most of the damage there jumping for joy and selling them around the world on the strength of the number of Armenians they killed. So um, part of the fight back 
will be to use Magnitsky laws, particularly in America, Britain, and uh, the new one in Europe, to actually target those who are responsible and cause them to be sanctioned. That's one way. It's not as good, it's not as effective as a war crimes trial, but Armenia has cut itself off from that by not ratifying the um, ICC treaty, which it should do tomorrow. Can I come in and, and respond partly to what Jeffrey has just said? Because firstly, as a great supporter of the International Criminal Court and, and the Rome Statute, I entirely agree with him about ratification, but I think that would be, even now at this belated time, it would be a good thing for Armenia to do. But he's also right about Magnitsky powers, and I was one of those who lobbied the British government. Mm. We should introduce Magnitsky laws here. And in fact, Bill Browder came in to see me. He's a bit of a hero of mine. And I, I entirely agree with Jeffrey that this is a power that can now be used. Uh, it was the very last thing that the government did before the summer recess. The very last thing on the last day, it was something Dominic Raab had promised to do. He is a friend of Bill Browder. His family, of course, were victims of the Holocaust. So our foreign secretary does understand this and I admire him for that. And he's done something about it. But Jeffrey, in addition to that, this week, the House of Lords, by, as I said, in a, by a large majority, passed mm. an amendment which would create a process, a mechanism. Um, we were advised on this by your colleague, uh, also Queen's Counsel, Sir Jeffrey Nice QC. We were advised to create a mechanism so that we could get these kinds of contested claims before the High Court of England and Wales. And our amendment has been passed it now goes to the Commons, and it does enjoy considerable support there. What this would mean is that the Armenian community in this country, the diaspora, could take the reports and evidence of genocide, and here to answer Jess's question, there is a big technical, legal, and I would say moral difference between what happens in war crimes, where, as Jeffrey said, these can be committed in, as acts of war against one another, and the deliberate creation of a genocide. The United Kingdom has still not recognized a genocide that took place at the beginning of the 20th century against the Armenians as being a genocide. The American House of Representatives a year ago did just that. And we, for political reasons, we don't want to upset Turkey. I mean, if we put cards on the table, that has been one of the reasons fear of losing trade deals and all the rest of it post Brexit is one of the reasons why we've been so reluctant. Well, this could be kick-started in the future by the Armenian community here. And frankly, if the Azeri community believe that a genocide has been committed against them, they would have the same opportunity. But I can tell you now what the High Court would make of any such claim. There has been no genocide against the Azeri community. There have been war crimes, and they, should be con they certainly should be investigated. But this is about the crime above all crimes. And we're creating a route to sit alongside the Magnitsky powers so that these questions can be judged in by British judges, uh, no doubt with co contestors being able to be there in the court, putting the other side of the case. I mean, one of our own Supreme Court judges now retired, spoke in the debate uh, this week in the House, Lord Hope of Cra Craighead, and David Hope said, this is a viable legal route. He said, for 70 years, we've seen the ineffectiveness, the ineffectiveness of the Genocide Convention, because it sounds good, but it doesn't actually get us very far. And I quoted Sir Hartley Shawcross, who was, of course, the senior pro British prosecutor 75 years ago at the Nuremberg trials. And he said that it wasn't good enough just to point the finger. You had to find ways of acting and then dealing with impunity, ensuring then that the people who are named in these actions, whether it's through either of the routes I've described, are then prosecuted if they can themselves be found to have authorised and stimulated the genocides that we've been talking about. Can I just make one intervention? And that is, while building on the two superb replies that have been given, uh, my priority at the moment, and that of most people in Nagorno Karabakh in Armenia, is how to rescue the prisoners of war who probably are being tortured while we speak, beheaded and so on. And are there any measures that can be taken for emergency action uh, to ensure the return of prisoners of war, which should be legally recoverable, but at the moment is totally ignored? And I know from the last war, the one that took place in the early 90s, that Armenian prisoners of war suffered so long and nothing could be done to rescue them. 
Thank you very much. There, uh, there is something, Caroline, called interim measures that can yeah. be ordered by, uh, for example, the International uh, the Human Rights Committee of the and by the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. I would have thought uh, that this is a case of particularly arbitrary detention. Uh, so there are avenues, whether Azerbaijan takes any notice of them is another um, matter. Yeah. Well, thank you. Maybe that combined with the threat of sanctions might have a little bit of leverage. So thank you. Yes, Azerbaijan would be very vulnerable to sanctions. The people around Haida, you've got to understand, <clears throat> it's a bit like Putin and his oligarchs. The people around Haida are uh, enormously rich and yep. enormously corrupt, and they are vulnerable now to yes. European Magnitsky sanctions about uh, its early days. But what is essential and uh, is to build up a documented list of the yep. war crimes and the crimes against humanity, and that can be used as evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I, can I can I jump in? Armenian government and parliament has uh, have made statements and have sent uh, many documents to international agencies on release of prisoners. They used exhausted almost all the remedies which are existing, but still there is no, uh, no, no result. What about the Red Cross? They did it also through Red Cross. They sent to Human Rights Council. They sent to uh, Court of Human Rights. Mm. It was sent all over. And statement but the, Re the Red Cross have got legal powers to visit the prisoners. Yes, they do. And they must, they must be required to exercise them. I, I'm not sure, and I may be speaking inaccurately, but I think they've requested Azerbaijan for permission. I'm not sure they've been granted it. And or if they have, then of course they can't speak about what it is that they witnessed. Well, that's true, but at yes, least they definitely. can provide a bit of succor for yes. the uh, prisoners. Maybe. Keep Thank you very much. I think we could continue this discussion for another half an hour, but of course, um, I promise that we'll finish quarter past five and I want to deliver on this promise. So I would like to just say a very quick um, conclusion. Big kudos to all our speakers for their great contribution. A big thank you to all of you who join us uh, today. It's a very complex topic and, and of course, uh, we've seen also that the there's a lot to unpack and a lot to maybe in the future investigate and, and of course, the issue of justice is very important as well. This was the last session for 2020, and I would say bye for now. And please join us for further uh, webinars in 2021. So thank you very much. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you, Evelina. Yes, Evelina, thank you very much for all you've done for the Coalition for Genocide Response and for organising these events, because <laughs> they're a nightmare in some ways for technical reasons, but it is an extraordinary experience when you bring us together in this way, and I, I think good comes out of it. So thank you again. <laughs>